Amen. So Acts chapter 9, so the beginning of Acts chapter 9, of course, is the story of uh, the conversion of Saul, or as you would know him, um, Paul, who wrote um, a good portion, most of the New Testament. This is how he became um, a believer in Acts chapter 9. So we'll look at that this evening. So let's remember just the context of what is going on in Acts chapter 9. We took a little bit of a break um, from what was actually happening. We talked about um, some stories with Philip in Acts chapter 8. But don't forget about what has just happened in Acts chapter 7 um, with the, the, the execution or the martyring of, of Stephen, um, one of the first deacons of the church. So, you know, obviously, you know, um, at the end of verse number, of, at the end of Acts chapter 7, we look down at verse number 60, um, and we saw that... Um, or we saw that Paul was there in the end of Acts chapter 7, not verse 60, but we saw that Paul um, was there. And we look at Acts chapter 9, verse 1, um, we kind of looked at these two verses already, but it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. So um, Paul, Saul, was there um, at the execution of, of Stephen. The Bible says that he was consenting unto his death. Um, Keep in mind that, that Saul, he heard Stephen's sermon. So we preached, I preached a whole sermon on Stephen's sermon itself. And remember, Saul was there and he heard it. So he knew the claims of the Christians at this point. He wasn't, he wasn't ignorant of the claims of what the Christians were claiming. He just didn't believe it. Okay, he just didn't believe it. So we see in Acts chapter 9 what God is going to do to change that. Look at verse number 1 of Acts chapter 9. Breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, talking about Christians, whether they be men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. So he went out of his way to get letters from the high priest to go to Damascus and get more um, Christians and, and try to round them up and stop this movement as it is. So he's, he's, quite the, um, he's quite the driver, as we've already talked about. He's quite the motivated individual. Look at verse number three. The Bible says, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Now he has the letters. He's going to get the Christians. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. So keep in mind, Paul, Saul, knew who the Christians claimed that the Messiah was. I mean, he heard, we know for sure he heard Stephen's sermon. He just didn't believe it. And now in verse number five, Jesus himself tells Saul, hey, it's me. It's Jesus who you're persecuting. And Jesus says, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. What he means there, whenever I read that, I always think about, like, if you're going to pet a porcupine, you better pet it the right way. You know, you don't want to pet a porcupine against the grain, right? Or pet an animal against the grain. Jesus is basically saying, Paul, you're, you're, you're swimming against the current, is what he's saying to Saul. He's like, you're swimming against the current. So he says, you know, you know Paul's biggest question, or Saul, i got to quit calling him Paul. He's not Paul yet. But Saul's biggest question at this point is, who is the Messiah? Because he just doesn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He heard Stephen say that you're all murderers and that you murdered the Messiah. He just didn't believe it. And now Jesus tells him, it was me. Okay, look at verse number six. And he, this is how he responds, he trembling. I mean, think about this scene for a second here. He's riding his horse or his, his ride of whatever it is. And he's riding it, and he's literally knocked off his donkey or his, his animal with this bright, shining light, with this voice from heaven that is Jesus himself saying, you know, you're persecuting me. Verse 6, he's, he's trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will thou have me do? Look, he doesn't argue with Jesus at this point. I mean, he's pretty much like, okay, I get it. You know, he understands. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, 
but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. So just imagine this scene for a second. He's this powerful Pharisee of the Pharisees, the Bible says. He's going out of his way to go. I mean, he, he's the kind of Pharisee. He can just walk right into the high priest and just ask for these letters. He gets these letters. This is an extremely powerful man. This is an extremely powerful man in the, the Jewish um, kingdom. And he goes and he gets these letters. He's a, he's a man of power. He can pretty much demand and do whatever he wants. And here he's, he's knocked off his horse. He's blinded. Jesus has, like, struck him down personally, and now he's literally being led by the hand. He can see nothing by just these servants that were with him. Okay, it's quite an extreme, um, you know, change of events for Saul here. And then look at verse number nine. It says, and he was three days without sight, neither did eat nor drink. Okay, so he goes and he's taken to the city and they, they just set him somewhere and he just, he just sits there and he doesn't eat or drink anything. Now, the main thing there that is surprising is like any one of us in this room could go three days without eating. Okay, that's an easy thing for someone to do. It might not be, you know, it might not be pleasant, but it's, a, it's an easy thing for anyone to go through. But three days without drinking is a fairly serious thing, especially in a, in a warmer climate like they are in here. So he goes and he's just in this, he's, he's completely broken down is what I'm trying to get you at, get, get you to understand here. He's broken down. He's taken from this man of great power to a man that can not even eat or drink or even feed himself because he is just blinded, like literally, without sight. He needs to be led around by the people that were his servants just a few minutes earlier. Okay, look at verse 10. And now we see another um, kind of a parallel situation happening, and there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. So God is saying here, you're kind of seeing both sides of what God's doing for Paul, Saul and what God is doing for Ananias. So God is telling Ananias that you're going to go and meet with this man, Saul of Tarsus. And then in, in the, at the same time, he's telling Saul to be praying and he gives Saul a vision that this man is going to come see him. So God is making a divine appointment of these two men right here. Look at verse number 12. And hath, um, no, verse 13, sorry, and Ananias answered, so he knows who Saul of Tarsus is, okay? And I mean, this just goes again to show you how powerful, how well known, you know, how effective Saul was at his job of persecuting the Christian. And Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem. And I mean, Ananias is like, are you sure you've got the right guy? Because this is a really bad guy. Ananias says um, to the Lord, all right? I mean, I like to think that if Jesus, like, came and, like, spoke to me directly, that I would just, like, say, like, whatever he wanted me to do, and I wouldn't, like, question him. But, you know, who knows? I mean, this was, just shows you how extreme the ask was of Ananias and how well-known, you know, Saul's evil against the church and against the believers was. Look at verse 14. And he hath their, he hath authority. So, I mean, this guy, he's, say, he's saying, like, don't you know what this guy's done? And don't you know how powerful he is, is what Ananias says to Jesus. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. So these people, think about the fear in this church. So Saul went and he got the letters from the chief priests and he was coming to Damascus. All the while, they knew he was coming. Think about that. Here, here the, the Christian church, imagine this church right here, you know, knowing that somebody's coming from San Diego or somebody's coming from, you know, Oregon or whatever, and they're coming with letters from the federal government that every single person at Hold Fast Baptist Church is to be thrown in prison. I mean, just imagine. I mean, tell me that wouldn't shake, you know, shake people's situation a little bit. I mean, it's a real thing. They knew he was coming. 
And then Jesus is telling him, hey, I want you to go meet with this guy. All right? But the Lord said unto him, verse 15, Go thy way, for he is, cho he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So God tells Ananias, you know, I always like to think like, you know, you should do that. When you're reading the Bible, I always like to kind of try to put myself in, in the situation. Sometimes we, you read things so many times that you kind of forget. I mean, it, it's, some people are better at this than others to try to put yourself in the shoes of the people that you're reading. But, you know, just try to do that as, as much as you can because it kind of, you know, puts some perspective on your life too. You know, put some perspective on, you know, maybe hard times that we think we're going through when we look at actually, you know, this story. I mean, this isn't just a story that we read in the Bible every single year when we read through the New Testament. This actually happened um, to a group of people, to a group of Christians. But God tells Ananias, he says, no. He's like, I am choosing him to spread the gospel is basically what he says. And then he says in verse 16, he says, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And this is what's really interesting because it's super important to understand that Jesus taught Saul. Jesus taught Saul, or as we know him, Paul. Now the key to understanding the timeline of Acts chapter 9 is Galatians chapter 1. So go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 1, and let's just make sure we understand like, the timeline of Acts chapter 9. A key to understanding Acts chapter 9, maybe put in the, just even if you make notes in your Bible, you should make a note next to Acts chapter 9 that Galatians chapter 1 is a key to understanding the timeline here of what happened to Paul. Because Paul, he gives us more detail in Galatians chapter 1. If you look at verse 13 of Galatians chapter 1, Paul kind of explains a little bit more detail about this timeline starting in verse 13. He says, For ye have heard of my... Con conversation in time past in the Jews religion how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it so here he's admitting he's admitting exactly what Ananias just told Jesus he's like I was like there was nobody that beyond measure he's like there was nobody that was better than me at this and profited in the Jews religion above many my equals in my own nation and being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Now go back to Acts chapter 9. So you've got to keep a place in, in Galatians chapter 1 and Acts chapter 9. So it says that he, he was called here. He, called, um, he, he was called by the grace of God. All right, now guess what? You say, whoa, is this Calvinism? What is this? Guess what? If you're saved, you are called by the grace of God. Here's the thing. Everybody's called. Everybody's called. God, wants, uh, God wishes that all men would be saved. But it just doesn't work that way because some people don't accept that grace. Okay, so look, if you're saved, God called you and you answered the phone. Think about it that way. You know, the point is, and the reason that it's such a drastic story here is because God just went to great lengths with Saul to call him because he had a purpose for Saul, which is the same purpose that he has for us, by the way. But he just really needed this man at this time to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. And then he says in verse 16, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. You know what he's saying there? He's saying as soon as the Lord knocked me off my horse as soon as, you know, I got knocked off my donkey or whatever I was riding. He's like, as soon as that happened, you know, I didn't go and like learn a bunch of doctrine from people. He's like, I didn't learn from people. Go to Acts chapter 9, look at verse 17. Let's continue with Ananias. Keep a place in, in Galatians chapter 1. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house. So Ananias is like, okay, I'll do it. And putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul... The Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mayest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. So obviously, Saul at this point has already seen the vision of Ananias that's going to come. In verse 18, and immediately there fell from his eyes, as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose, and was baptized. 
And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. So Saul is saved. So Saul is, is saved. He's got his sight back. He's, he's with the disciples. He's in Damascus. He's been baptized. And here we go. And straightway, it says right away, he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Look at verse 21. It says, but all that heard him. So right away, did it say he was like preaching some crazy, like deep doctrine? It says, no, he was just declaring Christ. Right away, he's just declaring that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Because what was Saul missing? That's what Saul was missing. He was just missing who the Messiah was. And straightway, he preached Christ in the synagogues. What? What did he preach? That he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed. They all knew who he was. He was powerful. He was famous. He was well-known. They all knew he was coming and said, Is this not the he that destroyed them, which called on his name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent? Came to, he was doing it in Jerusalem, and he came here to do the same thing, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests. But then look at verse 22. And now you've got to go to Galatians chapter 1 as I read to you verse 22. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. So now, you see what happened here? You see there's a timeline that we need to figure out here. Basically, from verse 20, where he was just declaring that Jesus is the Son of God, now he is in the synagogues at this point, and he is just like he's debating the Jews. And he's in there, and he's just proving from the Word of God, that Jesus is the Son of God. He's proving it through God's Word. How is he doing that? He's going and he's just showing all the prophecies. He's showing all the prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus. He's showing how, you know, if you know the Old Testament, if you know the Bible, there's no one else that you could think Jesus was. That's what he's doing. Now he's going into the deep things of God. But now look at Galatians chapter 1 and verse 17. You're like, how in the world... Did he do that? He says in Galatians chapter 1, 16, he said, I conferred not with men. He's like, I didn't talk to men. And Jesus has already said in Acts chapter 9, he said that I'm going to show Saul personally. And he gives us the answer in Galatians 1, 17. He says, I didn't confer with men. He says, I didn't talk to any men. He's like, neither when I, uh, when I went I up to Jerusalem. He's like, well, surely he must go to the apostles and learn what they have to teach him. He's like, neither went I up to Jerusalem, to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia. You're like, what? And returned again unto Damascus. Saul was in Arabia for three years, and he went back to Damascus. Go back to Acts chapter 9, and now it makes more sense. So in between, um, I believe that it's in between verse 22 and onward to verse 23 is where that that Arabian um, teaching by Jesus to Saul took place. And at first, at first when I, you know, I read through the Bible the first few times, I was kind of thinking like, all right, between verse 22 and verse 23, he must have just left for three years. But now as I read the Bible more, I actually think it makes more sense that Paul, that Saul, was, you know, Arabia is in that same area of Damascus. I believe that this was kind of, he was going in and out to Damascus at this time. You know, he was going and you know, being taught by Jesus as he came to Damascus and uh, preached in the synagogues. I mean, that's just my opinion about it. I mean, the Bible doesn't say one way or another. But basically, it's in this time frame that he was being taught by Jesus himself in Arabia, which is right around you know, in the Damascus area. Look at verse 23. And after that many days were fulfilled, this is that three years, the Jews took counsel to kill him. After three years, you know, I mean, he's, he's just proving that Jesus, I mean, they can't, they, they can't prove from the Bible, they can't prove from the Bible that it's, Jesus isn't the Son of God. They can't prove from the Bible that Jesus is not the Messiah. You run into the same thing yourself if you, people are starting to criticize your Christian life and they don't like the way you're doing this or doing that and they don't like what you're separating from and separating unto, you know, people will come up to you and just be like, hey, let's sit down with the Bible and talk about it and you will not have any takers ever because, like, it's just very clear what the Bible tells us to do. So if we use, like, the Word of God as your guide, you know, I mean, there, there's no debating the Word of God. 
All right, look at verse 24. So they're, they're tired of it. They can't, you know, they can't, they can't win the argument. They can't prove that Jesus um, was um, not the Messiah. But they're laying a weight known, or weighing a weight was, so they, they took counsel to kill him. They're like, let's just kill him. But their laying a weight was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him away by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. So, verse 26, then Saul goes to Jerusalem. So, he doesn't go to Jerusalem until three plus years after he is converted. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't get saved and run to Jerusalem. He gets saved. He gets taught by Jesus. He goes and he wears out his welcome by just preaching doctrine in Damascus. And then he goes to Jerusalem. That's the timeline. Okay, go to Galatians chapter 1 again, and I'll read for you Acts chapter 9, 26. It says, And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. So when he went to Jerusalem, he wanted to like get together with everybody and like, you know, be part of the church, right? But I mean this is three years later or more, they were all afraid of him. They're still afraid of him at Jerusalem. Again, proving the damage that this man did, the effectiveness that this man, effectiveness, if you will, that he had is his job of persecuting the church. And believe not that he was a disciple. They didn't believe it. They're like, he was, he was so bad that we just don't believe that he's truly saved. Look at verse 18 of Galatians 1. He backs this up again. So in, in, in Acts chapter 9, it says, after many days were fulfilled. In Galatians 1.18, it kind of answers um, this timeline. It says, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. Okay, so now we kind of, you have to have both things to piece together, you know, the timeline of events of Acts chapter 9. That's why Galatians chapter 1 um, is so important. I mean, so many parts of the Bible are like that. That's why we have four Gospels. That's why you'll have many of the same stories in many of the different Gospels. You just get a different angle. You get a little bit more information. You get a little bit different information um, from different accounts. I mean, the Bible is, um, is nice that way. All right, look at verse 18 of Galatians 1. After three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But again, and again, we see, you know, proof here that the other apostles, you know, didn't really want to see him that much, where he says in verse 19, but the other apostles saw I none save James, the Lord's brother. It's like he's basically saying, like, they wouldn't hang out with me. <laughs> this is what he's saying. They didn't want to have much to do with Paul. Go back to Acts chapter 9, verse 27. So we see Paul gets, uh, Saul gets saved. You know, Ananias meets him, you know, and, and then he, he goes through this three-year process of Jesus teaching him and then him wearing out his welcome, um, you know, just debating with the Jews and proving. It doesn't even say debating, all right? It just says proving to the Jews that Jesus was the Son of God. And in verse 27 it says, But Barnabas, now he's in Jerusalem, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken unto them and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he's kind of, Barnabas kind of like, you know, telling the, the apostles, no, he really did get saved. He's been causing trouble in Damascus for three years. The Jews tried to kill him there, kill him there. It says, and he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. So that's as far as we're going to take Acts chapter 9 um, this evening. There's some other um, stories we're going to look at, but I want to just kind of put across a concept to apply to you this evening. So why, why did God show such great mercy to Saul? You think about it for a second. He was so bad. He was so bad. He was so effective at being bad. He was doing so much damage to the church us in our simple minds would just say, God needs to just destroy that person. God needs to just wreck that person. I mean, obviously, now that we see the New Testament, we see how effective uh, Paul was as an evangelist, it's easy for us to look back and, and, and see how, how right God was. But imagine being at that time, how confused. Imagine being in Ananias' shoes at that time. You know, they probably knew people that, Paul had that Saul had persecuted in Jerusalem. I mean, they probably, the, the Christians in Damascus, they probably took this personally to a, a large degree. I mean, just imagine, you know, friends that you have at other churches. 
And imagine that somebody came and just horribly persecuted like those friends of yours, like a family that you knew somewhere was horribly, say they went somewhere and they were horribly persecuted for their faith to the point where they were like taken uh, away and, and locked in a dungeon somewhere. I mean, look, you would take that extremely personally. You, we would all be very upset. I mean, why? And, and just imagine the Christians thinking, why does God have such mercy on this man? So God went way out of his way here. God went way out of his way, like knocked this guy off his ride, made him blind, went through three days and three nights of no food, no water. I mean, just like really made an impact to, to get this guy on the right team. But why? Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Now, I want to show you this concept this evening and show how it applies to us directly. It's super important that we understand this in our Christian lives. You know, one of the things about the Bible is that you need to understand, like, you know, it, it's great to memorize chapters of the Bible. It's great to memorize things in the Bible. But you need to understand the concepts of who God is and how he operates by reading the Bible. And if you read the Bible enough, you will just, and you hear enough Bible preaching about just the true word of God, you will start to understand how God operates towards us. I mean, look, I'm not talking about just the gospel. I mean, we've all got the gospel. We're soul winners here. We understand the gospel. I'm talking about how God relates to us as our heavenly father. Okay, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Look at verse number 12. This is Paul. This is Paul talking to Timothy. And he's talking about who he used to be. And he's kind of giving some insight on why, you know, God went out of his way to make sure that, you know, he had a chance to understand, like, who the Messiah was. Look at verse 12. He says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. He's saying, I thank God that he showed me what he showed me so I would get saved. Look at verse 13. And yet now he says who he was. He says, who was before a blasphemer? He was blaspheming Christ and a persecutor and injury, injurious. Look, he's saying, like, I wasn't just, like, speaking badly against people. He's like, I was doing physical harm to people. He says, look, he said, but I obtained mercy. So he says all these bad things. I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. He's like, I was actually hurting people physically. But I obtained mercy. Why? Look what he says. Because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Here's the thing you have to understand about Paul. And this, is a, a, this, this, this we need to apply directly to our Christian lives. Paul, Saul, before he became, before God changed his name, Paul was sincere in his error. He was sincere. He thought that he was doing the right thing. He thought that he was doing the work of the Lord. Sincerely. He was sincere in his error. And that is why God had mercy on him. Turn to Titus chapter 1. See, look, there's different types of false prophets out there. You have to understand this. There's different types of false prophets. And Saul was a sincere false prophet. He thought that he was on the right side of God. He was sincere in his ignorance. And that is why God was merciful to him. But, uh, compare that with these types of people. Look at Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. And many times, many times that the Bible talks about specifically false prophets, it's this type of false prophet. Right? So I believe that, I mean, it's just, again, it's just my opinion, but I believe the false prophet of Saul is probably in the minority of false prophets. Because when the Bible actually speaks specifically about false prophets, it's more along the tone of Titus chapter 1. Look at verse number 10. It says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not. Why? Because they're ignorant? No, it says that there's all these unruly people. It's like, you know what that means, unruly? It doesn't mean they're like crazy and wild. It means they don't follow the rules. It means they don't care. Look, we see the exact same thing today. There's, there's many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers out there. They don't care about the rules. They don't care about the Bible. 
They don't care about what the Word of God says, especially they have the circumcision, talking about the Jews at this time, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole... He's like, they're fooling entire houses of people. They're fooling entire families. He's like, they're deceiving, you know, just multitudes of people, teaching things that they ought not. Why? For money! For filthy lucre's sake. This false prophet, look, this is, this is the Joel Osteens today. This is the Benny Hinn's today. These are the people that have turned religion into a business today. This is the church growth movement today. What do we got to do? What do we got to do? I mean, look, they're unruly. Why? What do you mean they're unruly? They don't follow any rules. Hey, let's get a rock band. Let's get some smoke machines. Let's get some, you know, girls up on stage to dance. Or let's get Kanye West in the place to, to just be an abomination everywhere. It's unruly. There's no rules. There's no rules. It's anything to get people in the doors of the church. For Phil, it's it's a business. And Joel Osteen can go out and he can say he can say, oh, but I wrote all these books. It helps so many people. Look, he's he's unruly. He's vain. He's deceitful. He's just he's just using God's word when it suits him, to to like promote a self help religion or something like that. It's a self help business, using you know God's name is what he's doing. He's claiming religion, and he's just, he's, 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 a, he's a religious psychologist, you know, using religiosity to sell and to bring people in the door. I mean, look, they're corrupting the word of God to make money is the, is the main type of false prophet that the Bible talks about here. But this was not Saul, is what I'm trying to get you to understand. This was not Saul. Saul was sincere. He thought he was right. And look, I have met sincere false prophets. I can think of one Lutheran pastor that I had met. Just one, though. One Lutheran pastor that I met 10 years ago that I believe is a sincere false prophet. He, look, he's a false prophet, but he just doesn't know. He just doesn't know. He's very sincere, um, believes it, not in it for the money, just, just sincere wrong. That was Saul. And look, I've got to hope, I've got to, you know, pray that God would show these sincere false prophets the way, just like he showed Saul. But look, this was not Saul, so I'm trying to get you to understand. He wasn't in it for filthy lucre's sake. He was just sincerely ignorant. He thought he was right. He thought he was right. Look at uh, Luke chapter 12. But look, this is why, and this is why, this, I, I need you to understand God's philosophy here. So I want you to look at the, we're going to look at um, this parable of, you know, the servants in Luke chapter 12 and verse number 40. We're going to start at verse number 42. But I want you to understand God's philosophy towards being ignorant and, and knowing. Because we can apply the same thing to Christians. Okay? So Saul obtained mercy because he was ignorant in what he was doing is the main point. All right, look at Luke 12 and verse number 42. Luke 12 and verse number 42. The Bible says, And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? So he's saying, who's a faithful servant? Who's a faithful steward? Look at verse 43. He says, Blessed is that servant whom the Lord when he cometh shall find so doing. Just Serving, doing the right things. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. He's comparing us and what we do in our Christian lives to a servant serving his master. Now look at verse 45. And it's interesting because most of the verses in this example that Jesus gives are about the servant that knows what he's supposed to do, but does not do it. Look at verse 45. Verse 45 through verse 47 are all talking about this type of person. But and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. So here's a servant that the, the Lord's not there. Okay, he knows what to do. The Lord's not there. He says, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat the men's servants and maidens and to eat and drink and to be drunken. This is the guy that it's like he knows better, but no one's looking. He knows better, but no one's looking. And, you know, this is the thing that just kills me about Christians, by the way. You'll find Christians that are verse 45. 
Like, did they, they not, like, did they not believe the Bible? I'm just like, you find Christians that are verse 45. They're like, no one's looking. Hello? You know, this guy thinks no one's looking, so I can just do whatever I want. And look, look what happens. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him. So look, the Christian that says, nobody's looking, I can do whatever I want. Look, the Lord is going to, look, you're going to get caught when you don't even, when you don't expect it, is what verse 46 is saying. And then at an hour when he's not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and he will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. You say, what, what, what is that all about? He's going to appoint him his portion with the unbelievers? You know what this is about? You know what this is about? This is about a Christian who thinks that they can just go off and do whatever they want, that no one's looking. I mean, it's like, it must not have any faith that God's real. I don't know. Or just not thinking about it. Maybe they're so in the world, or they're so filled with pride, or whatever. They just go off and they go into whatever sin that they want. They think nobody's looking. The Bible says that, that they're going to get caught. The Lord's going to come back and bust them at an hour that they have no idea. It says then they're going to be off with the unbelievers. What do you see happening to backslidden Christians that just get into a bunch of sin? Do you see those people in church? Do you see those people out sowing? No, they're living with the unbelievers. They might as well be an unbeliever. I mean, look, they're not an unbeliever, but they might as well be one because the Bible says we're supposed to treat them as an unbeliever. But, I mean, they just they go into all this sin. They think that they're never going to get caught. They get caught, and then they just... They're, they're, living, they're living a backslidden life in the world, is, is basically what verse 46 is talking about. Look at verse 47. Again, again, talking about that servant. He knew what he was supposed to do. This is super important that we understand this as Christians. Because the problem is, like, being in a church like this, listening to preaching like this, and then not doing it. This is why, like, people that just, like, they come to a church like this, and then they just... They don't want to do the things that the Bible says. They just don't end up coming to a church like this for very long. Because who wants to listen to preaching that tells you to do what you're supposed to do when you're not going to do it? It's just it's not a pleasant thing. Right? People don't like that. So usually they solve the problem themselves. But the point is, look at verse 47. And that servant, which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself. Look, here's the thing. Come into a church that preaches the whole Bible, you are going to know what the Word of God says. And as I sit up here, and I stand up here, and I, I, not only I preach the Bible to you, but then I yell at you and tell you you should actually be reading the Bible yourself. I'm like, hey, preaching. And then I'm like, hey, read the Bible too. Look, you're going to know what it says. You're going to, I mean, you're gonna, as we read the Bible, as we read the New Testament together as a church every January, you're going to figure out what the Bible says. You're going to know what the Lord's will is. But here's the downside right here. And prepared not himself, neither did according to his will. This is the person that hears the word of God, that reads the word of God, and does none of it, shall be beaten with many stripes. Verse 45 through 47 is all about the person that knew what they were supposed to do did none of it, and then the passage is ended with, they will be beaten severely, is what the Bible says. Now look at verse 48. Only the first sentence of verse 48 talks about the person that didn't know. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. This is the person that gets saved one day and just never gets into the Christian life. This is a person that just trusts on Jesus, gets saved, believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, and just does nothing with their Christian life. It's like they're going to be beaten with few stripes. You're like, that's not fair. Who are you to say what's fair, first of all? But this is how it works, and this is what we need to understand as Christians. It says, for whomsoever. Now he explains why. You say, why is it that way? And here's why. He explains why at the end of verse 48. He says, for whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be. Of him shall be much required. So what the Bible is saying is if, if you're in a Bible preaching church, if you, are, if you are reading the Bible, and if you have these, I mean, if you have a Bible, so many people just never even had a Bible. If you have a Bible, you have that blessing, you have the will of God in your hand, 
and you don't do it, it's like, look, much has been given to you, is what the Bible is saying here. It's like much has been given to you, so much is going to be required of you. And, and look at the next part. And to whom men have committed much. You know what that says? It says that like, to people that have the Bible, to people that are in a Bible-preaching church, to people that have uh, a pastor preaching to them, that have brothers and sisters helping them, to just have all this commitment given to them. It's talk, it says men have committed much. It says of him they will ask the more. Look, the Bible here is saying, God is saying that if, if you have these things and you have men that have committed to you and you have brothers and sisters around you that have committed to you, you have a church, you have the Bible, you have all of this, it's like, man, there's going to be a lot. There's going to be a lot that's expected of you. I mean, I hate to rain on your parade tonight, but that's you. This is, this is you who this is talking about. I remember, I mean, here's the thing. Most of the verse is, most of the whole passage is talking about the people that knew better and did nothing. Why is that? It's because that's most Christians. That's why. They know better and they do nothing. That's 90%. I mean, this is the Christian. It's just, it's so many people. They just, they just know what they're supposed to do and they just don't do it. They continue in pride. They continue in bitterness. They continue in sin. And they're just going to be beaten without mercy is what the Bible says. Look, God simply expects more from those that know the truth. I remember before we moved to California, my wife and I used to go uh, on the farm. On the farm, there was, a, there was a, a dirt road to get into the farm. It was like half a mile long. You had to drive into this dirt road, and we used to just take walks on that road in the evenings. And we, I mean, I was in the midst of, like, we had decided to move, and I was in the midst of just going through all the logistics of, of selling things and getting things ready to move and how we were going to how we were going to actually get to California. And it was just like, it was one of those moments that was just really like, just like, I felt like I was just uprooting my whole life. And like, that's what we were doing, is we were uprooting our whole lives. Like everything was being uprooted. <laughs> I mean, we were just pulling, we were pulling the whole tree out of the ground. And I, I made, I made some, I made a comment to my wife walking down that road that, that night. And I just said, I said, you know, the problem is, though, and I don't know exactly how I worded it, but I basically said the problem is you can't unknow what we know. You know, and I, I may have even said it along the lines like, I wish you could unknow what we know. Because it was just, it was such a disruptive event. It was so disrupt, disruptive to our families, to my career, to all the worldly things around us. It was just throwing into complete chaos. And I was just like, I was like, the problem is, though, is like, I can't unknow what we know now. Once you know the things in the Bible, once you know the gospel, once you're saved, and then you know that you're supposed to be going out and giving the gospel to other people, that that is literally your commission in, in this life on planet Earth, how, how can you unknow that? You can't. You know, that's, that's why we need to be the servants that know and are doing, that know and are doing. Because, look, it, it's too late. <laughs> that's, that's what I was saying to my wife. It's too late. I already know. <laughs> I, can't, I can't know it and, and not do it, or I know what's going to happen to me, is what I was saying in my life. So you're right. God puts pressure on those that have been given much. God puts pressure on them. He expects more from those that have been given much, which is, which is you, which is us, which is me, okay? And this is why, like, look, this is why for the Christian, uh, on the other side of this, the Christian that would, that would get into sin, the Christian that would get into sin, look, this goes for Christians and un I mean, this would be just life philosophy, so, I mean, kids, listen up. But here's the thing, if you get into sin, you just own it immediately, if you make mistakes in your life, own it immediately. Because the longer you stay in that, the, the worse it is going to be for you and the worse it is going to be for 
those around you. Why? Because you are knowingly doing it. You're not like Saul. If you are a Christian that knows the Bible and you are just going to willingly go into sin, that's the opposite of Saul. And what did Saul get? Saul got mercy because he was ignorant in his mistake. If a Christian who knows the Bible, knows the truth, knows God's commandments, knows what God wants for his life, gets into sin and just will not let go of that sin, they, I mean, just the smallest thing could end up ruining their entire life. And, and, and look, unfortunately, you, you'll see it happen. The minute you, and look, we're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to stumble along the way in this Christian life. The trick is this. You just admit it immediately. You just own it immediately. I don't care if we're talking about something at work. I don't care if we're talking about something with your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your spouse, your kids. Look, even with your kids. Look, as a parent, you're going to make mistakes. You know what you should do if you do something wrong with your kids? You know what you should do? You should own it immediately. What, admit, my, admit fault in front of my Yes. I have said that to my kids many times. Like, hey, I came down on you for that. That I, I was wrong. I, I, I saw it differently. I'm sorry. Look, as a parent, you're not going to make every decision perfect. And kids shouldn't expect their parents to make every single decision perfect. Because I'm just a man and my wife is just a woman. We're going to make mistakes. But guess what? You own your mistakes. As Christians, you're going to make mistakes. But own them immediately and own them fully. Don't be this half sorry type. Own them fully. It was my fault. There's no excuse for it. I made a mistake. Not, oh, it was my fault, but I, I, I just didn't. I just didn't know, and, and then you just follow up your apology with like 18 excuses. No, own it. Just own it. It's like, hey, that was a mistake. I shouldn't have done that that way. I'll try to do better next time. I don't know why that's so hard for people. Maybe I've apologized a lot in my life, but that's very hard for some people to do. Just own your mistakes. And then look, then you'll, then you'll get, you know what you'll get? You'll get mercy. You'll get mercy from the Lord. Don't be this person that just grabs onto your sin and it's just like, you know, this is why pride's so dangerous. Because pride is so dangerous, it'll make you hang on to your sin. It'll make you make excuses for your sin. And here's the thing about excuses. Like, everybody knows you did it. It's like the kid with the cookie jar. Like, he's got crumbs all over his face, and, you know, he's like, I didn't do it. He's got Oreo cookies all over his face. I didn't eat the cookie. It's like, everybody knows you did it. Just admit it. Just own it. Just own it. Because look, otherwise, you know, you're just not going to have mercy like Saul had mercy. So look, here's the other, th other side of that coin is that God expects more from us because we know. Because we know. And that's what he said about, that's what he said about Paul. He said about Saul, he's like, I'm going to expect, I'm going I'm to tell him about the great things that he is going to need to be, need to suffer for me. And, and God, God said that to Ananias. He's like, he is going to suffer greatly for me. So God puts pressure on the profitable. God expects more from the profitable. It's like, you know, one guy told me one time, he's like, you know, I, I did something really well at work a few years ago. And, and the, my boss came up to me and he said, hey, you know, what, you know what you get for winning a pie eating contest? I just had some success in some project or something. And I said, what? I was thinking like a bonus or, you know, some kind of, you know, raise or something. He's like, no, he's like, more pie. You know what you're saying to me? He's like, you know, since, since you did so well on this, I'm going to give you more work than everybody else. <laughs> that's, that's God, though. I mean, that was just my boss in that case. But that is what God, that's his philosophy. We know more. We've been given more. He expects more from us. So God expected a lot from Saul later on. Paul. But guess what? He delivered. He delivered with his whole life. And God will reward us. God will reward us. And Saul, he quit kicking against the pricks. He got moving with the current. And look at what he accomplished with his Christian life. All right? But he obtained mercy because he was ignorant in his sin. So that's the lesson for us. Okay? We're not ignorant. We have the word of God. We know what's right. We know what we're supposed to be doing. So let's save ourselves the, the trouble 
and, and let's, let's go with the current in this, kitchen, this Christian life and let's not kick, let's not pet the porcupine against the grain. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.